why do you think we dream? What place do we go to when we dream? And why are they useful? Not just um, not just the assimilation aspect, but just like all the crazy visuals that we get with dreams. Mm -hmm. Is there something uh, you can speak to that's actually useful? Like why we have such fun experiences in that dream world? So one of the camps in the sleep field is that dreams are meaningless, mm. that they are an epiphenomenal byproduct of this thing called REM sleep from which dreams come from as a physiological state. So the analogy would be, um, let's think of a light bulb, that the reason that you create the apparatus of a light bulb is to produce this thing called light mm. in the same way that we, we've evolved to this thing called REM sleep to serve whatever functions REM sleep serves. But it turns out that when you create light in that way, you also produce something called heat. It was never the reason that you designed the light bulb. It's just what happens when you create light in that way. Mm -hmm. And the belief so too was that dreaming was essentially the heat of the light bulb. That REM sleep is critical, but when you have REM sleep with a complex brain like ours, mm -hmm. you also produce this conscious epiphenomenon called dreaming. I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> uh, I And from a simple perspective is that I suspect that dreaming is more metabolically costly as a conscious experience than not dreaming. So you could still have REM sleep, but absent the conscious experience of dreaming was probably less metabolically costly. And whenever mother nature burns the energy unit called ATP, mm -hmm. which is the most valuable thing, <laughs> um, there's usually a reason for it. So if, we're, if it's more energetically demanding, then I suspect that there is a function to it. And we've now since discovered that dreams have a function. The first, as we mentioned, creativity. The second is that dreams provide a form of overnight therapy. Dreaming is a form of emotional first aid. And it's during dream sleep at night that we take these difficult, painful experiences that we've had during the day, sometimes traumatic. And dream sleep acts almost like a nocturnal soothing balm. Mm -hmm. And it sort of just takes the sharp edges off those difficult, painful experiences so that you come back the next day and you feel better about them. And so I think in that sense, dreaming, it's not time that heals all wounds. It's time during dream sleep that provides emotional convalescence. So dreaming is almost a form of, you know, emotional windscreen wipers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I think, and by the way, it's not just that you dream, it's what you dream about that also matters. So for example, scientists have done studies with learning and memory where they have people learn a virtual maze. And what they discovered was that those people who then dreamed, but dreamed of the maze, were the only ones who, when they woke up, ended up being better at navigating the maze. Whereas those people who dreamed, but didn't dream about the maze itself, they were no better at navigating the maze. So it's not just that you, it's not, it's sort of necessary, but not sufficient. It's necessary that you dream, but it's not sufficient to produce the benefit. You have to be dreaming about certain things itself. And the same is true for mental health. Mm -hmm. What we've discovered is that people who are going through a very difficult experience, a trauma, for example, a very painful um, divorce, those people who are dreaming, but dreaming of that difficult event itself, they go on to gain resolution to their clinical depression one year later. Whereas people who were dreaming just as much, but not dreaming about the trauma itself did not go on to gain as much clinical resolution to their depression. So That's fascinating. It, it's, I think to me, those are the lines of evidence that tell me dreaming is not epiphenomenal. And it's not just about the act of dreaming, it's about the content of the dreams, not just the fact of a dream itself. It's, first of all, it's fascinating. It makes a lot of sense, but then immediately takes my mind to, from an engineering perspective, how that could be useful in, for example, AI systems of, uh, if you think about dreaming as a, 
important part about learning and cognition and uh, filtering previous memories of what's important, integrating them. Uh, you know, maybe you can correct me, but I see dreaming as a kind of simulation of worlds that are not constrained by physics. <laughs> <laughs> so like you you get a chance to take some of your memories, some of your thoughts, some of your anxieties and play with them. Like construct virtual worlds and see how it evolves. Like to to, to play with those worlds in a safe environment of your mind. Safe in quotes cuz you could probably get into a lot of trouble with with the places your mind will go. But in um this 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 definitely is applied in much cruder ways in artificial intelligence. So one context in which this is applied is uh, uh, the process called uh, self-play, which is uh, reinforcement learning yeah. where, where, where uh, agents play against its, itself or versions of itself. And it's all simulated of trying different versions of themselves and playing against each other to see what ends up being a good. The ultimate goal is to learn um, a function that represents what is good and what is not good in terms of how you should act in the right. world. You create a set of decision weights yeah. based on experience and you constantly update those weights based on ongoing learning. But the, the experience is artificially created versus actual that's re right. real data. So that's it's a crude approximation of what dreams are, which is you're hallucinating a lot of things to see which things are actually. No, I think uh, it's, and it's been a theory that's been put forward, which is that dreaming is a virtual reality test space that is largely consequence free. Yeah. What an incredible gift to give a conscious mind each and every night. Now the, the conscious mind, the human mind is very good at constructing dreams that are nevertheless useful for you. Like they're they're wild and crazy, but they're such that they are still grounded in reality to a degree where anything you learn in dreams might be useful in reality. This is a very difficult thing to do because <laughs> it requires a lot of intelligence. It requires consciousness. Uh, th this has been effectively recently been used in uh, self-supervised learning for uh, computer vision with the, with the process of what's called data augmentation. Is That's a very crude version of dreams, which is you take data and you mess with it and learn, you start to learn how a picture of a cat truly represents a cat by messing with it in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, now the crude methods currently are cropping, rotating, distorting, all that kind of stuff. But you can imagine much more complicated um, generative processes that start hallucinating different cats in order for you to understand deeply of what it means for something to look like a cat. Right, what is the prototype of a, the archetype of a cat? Yeah, the archetype. I mean, this, that's a very difficult process for computer vision to, to, you know, to go from what are the pixels that are usually associated with a cat to like, what is a cat in the visual space? In the three-dimensional visual space that is projected on an image, on a two-dimensional image, what is a cat? Those are like fundamentally philosophical questions that we humans don't know the answer to, like linguistically. But when we look at a picture of a cat and a dog, we can usually tell pretty damn well what's the difference. Right. And I don't know what, what that is because you can't reduce that to pointy ears or non-pointy ears, furry or not furry, something yeah. about the eyes. It's been a long-standing issue in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience too is how, how does the brain create an archetype? How does it create schemas that are have general applicability, um, but yet still obtain specificity? That's a very difficult challenge. And we, we can do it, we do it. It's yeah, rather I, bloody amazing. And it seems like part of the toolbox is this controlled hallucination, which is dreams. <laughs> well, it's a relaxing of the rigid constraints you know, I often think of dreaming as, you know, it's from an information processing standpoint, you know, the prison guards are away and the prisoners are running amok in a delightful way. And part of the reason is because when you go into dream sleep, the rational part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is the part, it's like the CEO of the brain. Mm -hmm. It's very good at making high level, rational, top-down decisions and controlled actions. That part of the brain is shut down 
during REM sleep. But then emotional centers, memory centers, visual centers, motoric centers, all of those centers actually become more active. In fact, some of them are more active than when we're awake mm -hmm. in the dream state. That's fascinating. So your brain from a neural architecture perspective is radically different. Its network feature is not the same as wakefulness. And I think this is an immensely beneficial thing that we have at least two different rational and irrational conscious states that we do information processing in. The rational, the veritical, the page one of the Google search is wakefulness. <laughs> the more irrational, illogical, hyper-associative Google page 20 is the REM sleep. Both, I think, are critical. Both are necessary. That's fascinating. And again, fascinating to see how that could be integrated in the machines to to, to help them learn better and to uh, to reason better. And in some ways, we also know it from a chemical perspective too. When you go into dream sleep, it is a neurochemical cocktail like no other that we see in the at the rest of the twenty four hour state. There is a chemical called noradrenaline or norepinephrine in the brain. And you know of its sister chemical in the body called adrenaline. Mm -hmm. um, but upstairs in the brain, noradrenaline is very good at creating a very hyper-focused, attentive, narrow, it's sort of um, very um, convergent way of thinking to a point, sharp, focus, that's the only thing. The spotlight of consciousness is very narrow that's noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. When you remove noradrenaline, then you go from a high SNR, a high signal to noise ratio, where it's just you and I in this moment. I don't even know what's going on elsewhere. I am with you, noradrenaline is present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you go into REM sleep, it is the only time during the 24 hour period where your brain is devoid of any noradrenaline. It is completely shut off. And so the signal to noise ratio is very different. It's almost as though we're injecting a greater amount of noise into the neural architecture of the brain during dream sleep, as if it's chemically brute forced into this relaxed associative memory processing state. And then from an anatomical perspective, just as I described, the prefrontal cortex goes down and other regions light up. So it is a state that seems to be very, I mean, if you were to show me a brain scan of REM sleep and and tell me that it's not REM sleep, just say, look, based on the pattern of this brain activity, what would you say is going on in this person's mind? I would say, well, they're probably not rational. They're probably not having logical thought because their prefrontal cortex is down. They're probably feeling very emotional because their amygdala is, is active, which is an emotional center of the brain. They're definitely going to be thinking visually because the back of the brain is lit up, the visual cortex. It's probably going to be filled with past experience and autobiographical memories because their, their memory centers are lighting up. And there's probably going to be movement because their motor cortex is very active. That to me sounds very much like a dream. And it, that's exactly what we see in brain scanners when we've put people inside of them.